few months ago, William Schneider Jr. arrived at the Caps Media Center with an absolute treasure trove of Ventura history. Bill's father, William Schneider Sr., was a highly respected teacher throughout Ventura. For years, his hobby was recording on camera interviews and family histories with fascinating people all over the county. Recently, his son, Bill Jr., gathered together more than 100 tapes from his father's archives and working here at the Caps Media Center has painstakingly restored these treasures. Bill's new series, called My Father's Stories, explores some of the very early days of Ventura County. Most of the videos were recorded 20 to 30 years ago. The people, places, and stories Bill shares are part of Ventura's rich history. Welcome to My Father's Stories. I'm just amazed at how many stories there are, but you know, as you say, you and your father grew up here, so he knows these people. So who have we, uh, who have we got today? This is a two-part story, actually, and we'd like to talk about uh, Willard Edison. Uh, he, he's got some great stories. He's a retired CHP officer and tells some really good stories that occurred during his career as a higher patrolman. Willard talks about his first arrest, his first citations that he issued, and a very funny accounts of drunk drivers that he's pulled over. One drunk driver tried to bribe him for, with $2. Now the next story is about earthquakes, and this is very interesting. The U.S. Geological Study is a scientific agency for natural sciences, including earth science and biology. Right now, the agency is studying earthquakes in a place called Parkville, California. Parkville, California is the earthquake capital in Southern California. For some reason, the, it's Santa Clara, the San Andreas Fault goes right by Parkville, and they've had six major earthquakes, magnitude six or better, since 1857. It's amazing. So they've set up shop there, so to speak. They've set up lasers on either side of the San Andreas Fault that can measure it down to the, down to the thousands of an inch. And what's really amazing, these lasers have confirmed that the fault not only moves north, but it also goes backwards. And, and over a period of 10 years, it has gone forward six inches and it's come back six inches, six inches. It's an amazing story. Very cool. Parkville is a living laboratory for earthquakes. Nice. Let's see it. Tonight you're going to hear all the answers to those questions that you have about California Highway Patrol and how you should drive. Very serious program. I'd like you to meet Willard Edson. Hello, Willard. Pretty good, pretty good. You're looking great. Thank you. You look like you're retired. <laughs> huh? I've been retired. I'm enjoying it. I have. It's a great life. It is. It really is. It's a great life. You know, one of my biggest gripes on the freeway are these slow drivers that are hitting 30, 35 miles an hour. What do you, have you ever had any experience like with people like that? Yeah, that, you bet, that brings to mind the day that I'm working 101 on the Coneo grade. I'm northbound, it's a Sunday afternoon, and traffic is backed up and I can't figure out why, because we're northbound coming down the grade. I work my way up through traffic, and I find the problem. <laughs> it's a female driver in the fast lane, about 25, 30 miles an hour. And I finally work my way in behind her, and I think now that everybody knows that when you turn the red light on, you pull to the right shoulder and stop. Well, I find out that she doesn't know this because I turned the red light on her, and she stopped right in the number one lane. Oh, wow. Well, now I just thought I had problems before. <laughs> so I get out, and I ask her to move to the right shoulder. Well, I ordered her to move to the right shoulder. Pulled in behind her, and then we had a conversation, and I decided not to issue a citation because of the language that I had used in asking her to move to the right. <laughs> So I told her, I says, okay, I says, now the plan is this, you gotta get back in traffic, 
So wait for the opening. When you see the opening, accelerate hard and merge in with traffic. She said she understood, and I got back in the patrol car, and I sat down, and I'm watching my rear view mirror, and I see the hole approaching, and I look forward, and her backup lights are on. <laughs> she did just exactly what I asked her to do. She accelerated hard, and she hit me like you can't believe. So now we had another conversation, and I told her the plan was this. I said, this time... I'm going to leave, and you stay here. And to my knowledge, she's still sitting alongside the road down there. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, have you ever had any, uh, oh, for, say, fraternal brothers or anything like that plead innocent to you or anything? Yeah, I was working up on the Rincon one afternoon. I take a speeder northbound getting stopped just inside the Santa Barbara County line. Now, one of the things you have to understand that here I am, Ventura, married, got six kids, <laughs> and we take our orders right from the Pope. <laughs> yeah, I'm Catholic. <laughs> yeah, okay. When I stopped this car now, I look up and I see the license plate bracket on there, and it has a license plate bracket of a well-known Shriners Temple from Los Angeles. And in the back window, there's a little little uh, fez that says yeah. High Noble on it. And as the gentleman approached me, he has a little sword in his lapel. Now, I know that I'm not going to meet him at my next night's of Columbus <laughs> meeting. <laughs> and so I told him why I stopped him. And he said, yeah, he knew that he was a businessman out of L.A. He was on his way to Santa Barbara. And he had been speeding. And he, But he came over and he looked right at my nameplate. And he says... <clears throat> E-I-D-S-O-N, good Anglo-Saxon name. He says, what really burns me is to get a ticket from one of those Catholic cops. <laughs> I didn't have the courage to tell him. <laughs> you didn't write him up. No. I did write him up, but they didn't tell him <laughs> that I was Catholic. You know, with the freeways and the on-ramps and off-ramps, I bet you find folks that are a little confused in which way they're really trying to go. Again, I'm working graveyard one night. <laughs> Me and my partner were sitting on a ramp down in Island Acres. See a car, I don't even remember what he did. He's going northbound, we get in, we stop him. We're stopping northbound right at Wagon Wheel. Two guys in the car, they get out, we get out, and we meet back in the car there, and the driver says, you know, as always, what, what'd you stop me for? I said, hey, stopped you for speed. He says, uh, where are you headed? And the driver says, uh, I'm going to San Francisco. And my partner says, well, uh, if you're going to San Francisco, what are you doing here? And he says, well, where are we? He says, you're in the outskirts of Las Vegas. <laughs> Is he all that neon? And he's, before we could do anything, his partner stepped forward and hit him right in the mouth. <laughs> and he says, I told you you took a wrong turn out of Los Angeles. <laughs> Uh, well, there's always a first, a first thing. Your first arrest, let's say. My first arrest Your was first arrest. out in Santa Susana before it's grown up like it has today. And I'm working out there, and uh, at that time, they, when you, they sent you to Santa Susana, you had done something wrong, <laughs> they were punishing you. And the first guy that I ever arrested for the suspicion of being under the influence of alcohol was driving a farm tractor. Now, the rear wheels are taller than I am, and I get him stopped, and I look up at him, and I says, uh, well, can you get down from there? And he says, sure, <laughs> but he doesn't move. <laughs> uh, I says, well, will you get down from there? And he says, sure, and he stands up and steps off and falls right to my feet. <laughs> and then he, he wasn't hurt, and he rolled over, he says, no, is that what you had in mind? <laughs> Always a said to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, all through life, I guess the most trouble that I ever get into is with the short Napoleonic type. And I bet you, you've run into those too. My partner and I are working graveyard again. Camel the area. They sure stick you on that night uh, shot. Well, I, I don't really know how we had so many kids. That's what my wife said. <laughs> We're working graveyard, northbound 101, and my partner's driving. We come in behind this car that he appears to be having a hard time 
navigating up the freeway. So we made the stop. Now my partner is up. And well, this means that he's going to handle the whole thing. I'm just going to watch. So he gets the driver out. Now my partner is about six foot five. And the driver turns out that he's about five foot three. And they made a, quite a couple sitting there alongside the freeway. And Dick gives him his uh, field sobriety test and determines that he believes he is under the influence of alcohol and he makes the arrest. He says, okay, he says, now what I'm going to do, he says, I'm going to put the handcuffs on you. The little guy says, no, he says, you're not going to put the handcuffs on me. And Dick says, wait a minute, he says, we can either do it the easy way or the hard way. It, it's your choice. He says, let's try the hard way. I thought it was a bad choice that he made, but that was his choice. Well, Dick just walked up to him, grabbed him, put the handcuff around one wrist, put it around the other, and that's all there was to it. Except the little guy wasn't through yet, because now he turns around and says, ah, that wasn't so hard, was it? <laughs> Have you ever been bribed or attempted bribed? Yeah, one time. And I was working by myself up on Route 33, and I'd made the stop on Stanley Avenue. Very dark, no other exterior lights around. Now the guy that I'm arresting, he is, he's being arrested for the suspicion of being under the influence of alcohol. And uh, he is really, really ripped. Now he, he lives on San Ysidro in Santa Barbara. He thinks that's where he is. So we make the stop, and I'd say I place him under arrest, and he says, wait a minute, he says, before he says, and he puts some money up in my shirt pocket and says, look, he says, let's let that take care of it. And I says, I gave it back and I put it back in his shirt pocket. And I says, now you don't want to get involved in something like this. We went back to the jail there on Poli Street. And when we got into the light, I had to look and see what he, how much he had offered me. Two dollars. <laughs> it hurt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, now, how about a story about your favorite officer? That'd be Jules DeMore. Jules just passed away here a mm -hmm. short time ago, and he and I work in graveyard together. Now, when you work graveyard, there's not much that they can do for you, so they give you the newest car in the squad. Well, this new car... It had the, the dodge with the selector arm instead of the push button. Well, that's where, always before, we had the dodges, push button, gear shifts. Now we have the selector arm. Well, they give us this brand new one. Now, Jules nor I had ever driven it before. He's driving first. He's a senior officer. And we're sitting in at northbound 101 at Cayagos Road. We see a uh, spear going southbound. Appears to be a spear. Jules says, what do you think? I says, yeah, you look pretty good. Let's try him. So Jules started the engine. He dropped that selector arm down one notch, accelerated, and we went straight backwards <laughs> about 100 feet. So Jules finally got it under control. He says, he dropped it down one more notch and he accelerated again, and the engine almost came off the mouth because now it's in neutral. So Jules drops it down one more notch. We come across out across the northbound lanes, across the center divider, into the southbound lanes. We don't know if he was a speeder. We never saw him again. After that. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> well, that's wild. You should have had that one on tape. That's how, that was a good one. Uh, seat belt. I tried to get out of the car the other day. I'd forgotten to take my seat belt off. That's about time. Well, this, yeah, that reminds me of, uh, at, which is, this is one that I enjoy the most. Gene is driving a 1967 Oldsmobile. Now, always before we'd driven Dodgers, seat belts open up like this. Okay, nobody told us that you pushed the button. Yeah. Gene's driving this brand new Oldsmobile, about nylon acres. Makes a stop, the guy pulls to the right, Gene pulls in behind him. But this guy begins to look around because Gene doesn't appear at the door. He gets out, he goes back and he says, uh, to Gene, he says, what's the problem? Gene says, 
I'll tell you the problem. He says, I can't get the seatbelt open. <laughs> so this guy helps him. He doesn't know either. They pull it all the way out, and Gene slithers out to the ground. <laughs> so, did you give him a ticket, Gene? He says, no, he didn't give him a ticket. They didn't even want to know his name. <laughs> hey, it's been great, Willie. Thank you, Al. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. Now, all this is all you have to do in these years is tell, tell stories, right? <laughs> That's right. We've been visiting with Willard Edson, retired highway patrolman. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Parkfield section of the San Andreas Fault passes right under my feet, approximately, uh, under this bridge at this angle. And we get a constant slip out here of about... Uh, well, if you go far enough north an inch a year in here, it's a matter of fractions of inches or millimeters. And this bridge, you can see, is bent, and that's an action that the fault has caused. The bridge was built in 1930, and uh, in 1930 it was straight. And since 1930, they measure about uh, some 28 inches of creep here or more that this bridge shows along the San Andreas. So this is an interesting thing to look at, and it shows that our fault is moving. Most of this movement took place during the 66 earthquake and the 34 earthquake. However, it creeps a little all the time, so this bridge shows that creep. So I like to talk about it as a, as a creep meter, but it wasn't built for the purpose of being a creep meter. It was built to get across this creek here. And, it's a little interesting to think about, depending on how bad the earthquake is, it's possible that this bridge won't be usable after the earthquake because it's going to get torqued pretty good if the fault slips very much. The San Andreas Fault shows us right lateral slip here. And uh, so we can talk a little more about that at our next stop, but I wanted to get a shot of this bridge. Terrific. Here, and across from me is the Pacific Plate. This is one of the most obvious and the narrow sections of the San Andreas as it passes through the park field area. So I like to show people this because the neat thing about this is this North, this North American plate that I'm standing on goes clear on out beyond New York. So this is one big block of land. I walk across here, across the fault, and I'm standing on the Pacific plate which goes clear on out beyond Hawaii. So this is a real interesting section of the San Andreas Fault as it passes through Parkfield. Again, we have right lateral slip here, which means this Pacific plate that I'm on right now is moving towards San Francisco. And there's a way to document that geologically. The Ninox in Southern California and the Pinnacles up this way Fort King City, used to be together. Now those two formations are 195 miles apart, approximately 200 miles, and that all happened because the Pacific Plate is moving to the northwest and grinding along the North American Plate, and right here is the border of those two plates. So that's a rather interesting, interesting commentary on the San Andreas Fault. There's one more thing that's interesting. In the study of Parkfield out here, they have learned that there's a segment of that same formation that you find that the Ninox have in Southern California and the Pinnacles have north of here. There's part of that formation that stayed out here in what we call Lang Canyon. So we know that it passed through here at one time and part of it broke off. So that's, that's kind of an interesting thing about the San Andreas. This part of the fault right in here does not creep as much as the northern part that we spoke of earlier. And there's a little more movement at the bridge, which is approximately a half mile from where we are right now, than there is here. As we go south, the fault locks up more and more, and there's less and less movement. So basically, right in here, you don't see a whole lot of movement, but we're watching some, which we'll talk about when we take our next stop up on the hill where I'm taking me. Turn around further back? No, that's okay. fine. That's fine. Here we go. We're up on Carr Hill now, which is located uh, real close to Parkfield. And up here, we have a two-colored laser 
two-color geotomy, geotomy, geotometer, as it's called, and uh, it's utilized uh, along the fault here to take measurements of very minute movements. So this instrument in here works on the following principle. We know how fast light travels. So in the surrounding hills here around us, surrounding foothills, we have 18 permanent reflectors. And they're mounted on a pier in concrete, so they move with the earth. And we put them inside sheds so the animals wouldn't wind up bumping into them and, and birds building nests in them and things. And we take measurements to those reflectors. And the way this geotometer works is you send a beam of light out. You know how fast the light travels, so you keep track of the time it takes to go out to that reflector and come back. And by doing that, in real simple terms, we get these measurements that are very accurate. On a five kilometer line, I can measure to within 1,500 hundredths of a millimeter accuracy on a good night. So I can tell right where that reflector is in relationship to where it was the night before or the two or three nights before that I've taken measurements. So I can track the movement. We've got some reflectors out here that just constantly keep moving. We've got one up this direction across the fault from us. So if we're going to the northwest toward it, which we are, it, it actually is moving, we're moving toward it, so the line to that particular reflector is contracting at a regular rate most of the year. Something we've learned here in Parkfield about the San Andreas is that it just doesn't move one direction. At a certain point, it will actually reverse and move a little bit the other direction, but basically the trend is for us on this side to go to the northwest. Okay, so that particular line we're watching there generally contracts, and I've been doing this now for over six years. And in those six years, I have seen uh, over 10 millimeters of contraction each year. Uh, and that's without any earthquakes to speak of. That's just slip along the fault. And you like a fault to move and slip in little amounts rather than waiting for so many years and then breaking loose. Why are we in park fields studying earthquakes? This is nature's laboratory for the study of earthquakes because out here we have this neat pattern of earthquakes, if you can call it neat. I, I don't wish for an earthquake. I haven't been through any park field earthquakes and I'm not looking forward to going through an earthquake, but I'm hoping that studying here in park field we can find out what happens before an earthquake so that we can predict and warn people in populated areas. No one's ever been injured in a park field earthquake that I know of, so we're not out here to, to protect people in park field, we're out here to learn. And park field had an earthquake in 1857 when the Fort Tejon earthquake occurred down in Southern California. So that's the last time the southern section of the San Andreas Fault moved and that much time between earthquakes is where you build up a lot of pressure and that's when it becomes more dangerous. In Parkfield, since then, we've had a number of earthquakes. I'll give you the date on those. 1857, 1881, 1901, 1922, 1934, and 1966. Now, if you put that down and look at it, you'll see a neat pattern of about every 22 years for the Parkfield earthquakes. So when we saw that pattern, some of the scientists got together and they said, hey, there ought to be another one around 1988. So they put about a nine year window in there. So they started about 83, 84, and went to 93, somewhere in that category, and said between, that, between those years, there should be a Parkfield earthquake. Most likely time, 1988. Uh, it never occurred in 1988, and we're still waiting. You know, when you're ready for something, sometimes it doesn't happen. <laughs> Not that you can ever be ready, but we were trying to get data off the next earthquake. What we want to see is what are the precursors before an earthquake? And by looking at those precursors, maybe we can take that information to other parts of the world and give people a warning that there's an earthquake coming because we know that some things happen before earthquakes. We just want to learn more about what happens. 
Uh, on this job, I used to watch, and when there was a lot of movement, I'd go home and move the heavy things off the shelves and, and kind of be waiting. Well, in the six years I've been here, uh, we haven't seen enough change to generate that earthquake, so now I'm a little more relaxed about it. But I don't know whether just before the earthquake it's real quiet and I'll see less movement along the fault, or whether I'll see more. I sort of expect that I'll see more movement just before that earthquake occurs. So that's why we're up here taking these measurements. Uh, I have, again, 18 reflectors all the way around here. Some of them are on the same side of the fault that we're on now. Some of them are across the fault. On the same side of the fault that we're on, we should see less movement than we see across. This project is the result of a lot of different organizations working together. Basically, I work for Ceres, which is the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences. I work for the inventor of this machine. His name's Larry Slater, and he's in Boulder, Colorado. So Ceres is involved in this experiment. Also, the U.S. Geological Survey is heavily involved in this experiment. In fact, they're the ones that contract with Ceres so that I'm up here taking these measurements with this instrument. So we've got a lot of people working together on this experiment, trying to see what we can figure out about earthquakes and what... Looking at uh, one of our reflectors, it's a kilometer away. That's the laser light being reflected off the, the uh, parabolic telescopic mirror in the back of it and coming back to us. This works on the principle of how long it takes the light to go out and how long it takes it to come back. As I told you before, we know how light, how fast light travels, so with some careful calculations through the computers and the frequency counters, we can get a very, very accurate distance on how far away that point is. Hopefully we'll see something before an earthquake. We don't have a history here to work with. No one's ever watched this closely in an area where there are earthquakes. So we're kind of making our own history and we're in the pioneering stages, but I hope we get a breakthrough because warning people about earthquakes could save a lot. Yeah. We're close to the uh, laser building up here and this area right in here sort of shows you where the southwest fracture goes. So in Parkfield, there's more than just the main trace of the San Andreas going through. But one of the things I want to be sure that we uh, make clear today, you just saw one part of this total experiment. There are a lot of different instruments out here. They measure the amount of radon in water. They keep track of the water table and where the water levels are. They keep track of, of the creep by using creep meters, which are wires stretched across the fault at a 30 degree angle in a fancy apparatus and they have tilt meters out here and they have different borehole projects where they get down as far into the earth as they can. There's an abandoned oil well out here that uh, goes down one mile into the earth. That's the deepest uh, study that we've got in Parkfield. The idea is to get down close to where the action is. So we have that one but of course it's a lot, it, if we could get deeper it would help a bunch. There are many, many different projects out here and what we covered today with just one small part. So the U.S. Geological Survey has many experiments out here. Uh, the state of California has quite a few experiments. So there are lots of things going on in Parkfield. This is nature's laboratory for the study of earthquakes. Probably we have the most instruments in a given area of any country in the world. Japan would be the closest to us, but I still think we have them be so people from all over the world trying to see what we learn from it and working with us. So hopefully we can come up with something good. Thank you very much, Dwayne. You're welcome. Been a great afternoon.